Hello, today we're going to answer the rhetorical question, what is a group? So what exactly is a group? Well, we can write down an abstract definition, but it'll be precise. We say that a group is a pair consisting of a set G and a binary operation, which we'll denote here by a small circle, that satisfies four axioms. But wait, before we get into all of that, what does this mean exactly? What is this idea of a set? And what is this, this idea of a binary operation? Well, first, a set we'll call a collection of elements. For now, we won't really get into detail of what that means. But there are many examples of sets that you probably have seen before. Let's start with the natural numbers, which we'll denote by the letter capital N. These would just be the collection of counting numbers, which we can think of as 0, 1, 2, 3, and so forth. We don't have to choose 0 to be a natural number, though, and a lot of times other people don't. We can also consider the integers. We'll denote this by a capital Z. These will be the natural numbers along with their negatives. So for example, some integers will be 0, plus 1, minus 1, plus 2, minus 2, and so forth. This notation is inspired by the German word Zahlen, which simply means number. We can also consider the rational numbers, which we'll denote by capital Q. This will be the ratio of two integers, which we can denote by P and Q, where in the denominator, we simply don't want it to be zero. This notation is inspired by the word quotient. We can consider the real numbers, which we'll denote by a capital R. For now, we won't get into the exact definition of a real number, but we can think of the square root of two, the number E, and the number pi as examples of real numbers. And we can consider the complex numbers, which we'll denote by a capital letter C. These will be numbers in the form A plus BI, where A and B are real numbers, and here we'll let I be the square root of minus one. Here you can see a diagram of how all of these sets are put together. You can see that zero here is put in the middle as part of the natural numbers, and we can enlarge to include more and more numbers, such as maybe the negative integers to get back the integers, ratios of rational numbers to get back the rational numbers, things like the square root of two to get back the real numbers, or even the imaginary number i, the square root of minus one, to get back the complex numbers. But there are examples of sets which don't just include numbers. If you've taken linear algebra, you probably have seen vectors. For example, a two-dimensional vector space over the real numbers will be this collection here. Here you can see that we have this vertical strip, x comma y, where x and y are real numbers. We might also want to consider matrices. In this example, you can see that we have a collection of two by three matrices. That is, you have an array with two rows and three columns. The entries here, which we're denoting by a, i, j, will all each be a complex number. Or we might even consider polynomials. In this example, we're considering polynomials of degree at most two, that is, functions of the form ax squared plus bx plus c, where a, b, and c are rational coefficients. Next, we can define what a binary operation on our set G might be. It's simply going to be a function that takes a pair of elements, which we'll denote by A and B, and it returns a third element, which we can write here, circle of A and B. There are many examples of binary operations. One would be addition. We could take two numbers A and B and define the circle binary operation as simply the sum A plus B. Or we can consider subtraction. Given two numbers a and b, we can define circle as a minus b. Or we can define multiplication. Given two numbers a and b, our circle will simply be a times b. Or we can consider division. Given two numbers a and b, we can define circle to be a divided by b. Well here, we want to make sure that b does not equal to zero. You maybe have seen a meme on Facebook that kind of goes something like this. You have this operation, which you can see on the screen here is plus, and you get back these funny answers that don't seem to correspond to regular addition. That's because the plus here is actually a different type of binary operation. 
it's actually not too hard to check that the binary operation that works in this case will be taking two numbers a and b and return a times b plus 1. You can use this here to figure out what the last number would be, 8 circle 11. So let's go back and try to define a group again and pay very close attention to what all of the words meant. A group is a pair consisting of a set G and a binary operation, well we just went over what those meant, consisting of four axioms. First, we want closure. What that means is, given two elements A and B, we should have a third element, a circle B. Well, this axiom holds automatically when circle is a binary operation, just from the way the binary operation is defined. The second axiom we'd like to have true is associativity. This says that if you're given three elements, A, B, and C, then you shouldn't have to worry about which two you combine together under your binary operation to get first. As the name suggests, binary means that you can only take two at a time, and what associativity seeks to do is unambiguously define how to get three elements together into a fourth element. You can see here that the parentheses are arranged so that it really doesn't matter what order you use to try to write down what the operation is. Next, we'd like to have an identity. This means that there should exist at least one element, which we'll denote by E, such that A circle E is the same as E circle A, which is A, for all elements A. Such an element E we will call an identity. Fourth, we'd like to have inverses. That means the following. Let's let A be an element of our set G. Then this axiom asks whether there exists at least one element B such that A circle B is the same as B circle A, which is our identity from the previous axiom. If such an element B does exist, we will call this an inverse of A and we'll denote it by this A raised to the negative one. Now there'll be times when we will have a group that satisfies these four axioms, but we might want to impose another axiom that says that the order in which we do our operation shouldn't matter. If that's true, then we say that our group is an abelian group. In other words, we need to have commutativity. So an abelian group is one in which the four axioms above hold, but then we have a fifth axiom, a new axiom, that says A circle B should be equal to B circle A for all A and B and G not just whether B is the identity or whether B is equal to an inverse. Now, I'd like to end with some remarks now that we've introduced all of these ideas. First, some of you who've seen some of these definitions of groups before may have noticed that our definitions are slightly different. One is that it comes down to how we're defining our identity and the other one is how we're defining our inverse. You'll notice that I said earlier that we're simply assuming as part of our axioms that there exists at least one identity. Well, one of the properties you can prove of groups is that this identity is actually a unique element. There's exactly one. It's a similar statement for inverses. Before, as part of our axioms, we simply said that A should have at least one inverse. Again, if you have a group, you can prove that this inverse is unique. Once you know that, then you can write down some rather obvious statements, that the inverse of an inverse should be your original element. But now here's a non-obvious statement, that if you take the inverse of a product, then you have to reverse the order of the inverses. So you can actually write down some very nice properties just based on the four axiom listed before. So we've said here that once you know that there exists at least one identity, then this identity is unique. So that almost suggests that maybe you can do a little bit less work to prove that all four of these axioms are true. It even proves them stronger results. So let's see. If we want to prove that a certain pair is a group, we do have to check that four axioms hold, but let's try to review those four once again. For closure, we don't really have to check anything because once we know that circle is a binary operation, then the first axiom automatically holds. For the second axiom, identity, 
is a matter of finding at least one element E such that A circle E is E circle A is A for all A. This is like trying to solve some type of an equation. We can say something very similar for inverses. Let's say that A is a given element. Well, we're really just trying to find at least one element, let's call it A raised to the negative one, such that A circle A inverse is equal to A inverse circle A, which is the identity E. So again, it's like a matter of solving an equation. We're simply trying to find an element that works. So the one that we haven't talked about is associativity. What's surprising is that we can actually rewrite associativity using nothing but fancy arrows. You can see that here we have two sets of arrows on the screen. And let's try to chase through them to see exactly what's happening here. Let's start with three elements from our set G. Call them A, B, and C. In the diagram, this is like starting from the upper left-hand corner. Now, a binary operation says that we can only operate two elements at a time. Well, if you're given three elements, there are naturally two ways in which you can combine at least two of these elements together. One is you can combine A and B, and the second is you can combine B and C. If we were to do the former, that would be the same as starting at the upper left and going downwards to the lower left. We start with three elements, A, B, and C, and now we're left with two elements, namely A circle B and C. Similarly, we could have traveled to the right by starting at the upper left and traveling to the upper right. There, we would have started with three elements, A, B, C, and have been left with just two elements, namely A and B circle C. Now, we could reverse the roles here and I could have started on the lower right and traveled, excuse me, on the lower left and traveled to the lower right, or I could have started up on the upper right and traveled down to the lower right. If we start on the lower left, that is A circle B and C, we can combine those two together to find parentheses A circle B, parentheses circle C. If we would have started on the upper right and traveled down, we would have ended with A circle, parentheses, B circle C, parentheses. The whole idea of being commutative is that it should matter the order in which you take these paths to go from the upper left to the lower right. But now if you stare at the symbols here, traveling from the upper left to the lower right in two different directions is exactly the statement of associativity. So if you will, what we've actually shown here is that one can possibly define groups just using arrows. And yes, there's an entire branch of mathematics that does just this. Thanks for watching.